Coming up on this edition of Oliver North's America, Tracy Lawson on Answering Liberty's Call. Welcome to this edition of My America. I'm Oliver North. Our guest today, Tracy Lawson. Her passion for storytelling led her first into educational theater and dance, where she spanned a career of nearly three decades, even though she doesn't look old enough to have done so. Tracy has recently turned her hand to writing her debut historical novel, Answering Liberty's Call. I've got it right here. It is a great read. It's about Anna Stone and her daring ride to Valley Forge. A family legend provided the framework for a look at the American Revolution from a woman's perspective. Tracy, thank you for joining us today. I've got to ask you this. Is, is the, the protagonist is a real person in this novel, yes? Yes, she is. She's my six times great grandmother. So you, you are connected to the American Revolution by yes, family Yes, direct lineage. descendant. Mm -hmm. Well, my last novel was about the American Revolution, a fellow by the name of Daniel Morgan, and I've got a protagonist who keeps company with him. How did you first learn about Anna's story? Yes, I first learned about Anna's story when I was compiling family genealogy into an anniversary book for my parents for their 50th wedding anniversary. I was looking for any interesting stories on both sides of the family, and I came across Anna's story, the story of a woman who, when she learns of the privations at Valley Forge, decides that she's going to take whatever she can carry on horseback to her husband and brothers there. And along the way, she ends up becoming a courier, bringing a secret message to General Washington. So, in, in, of course, in the middle of the American Revolution, particularly at Valley Forge, they're in a pandemic as well, because it was... Absolutely. Smallpox was rampant. Yeah. Yeah. And more, more soldiers fell to disease than to gunshot wounds. What do you think went through her mind about what was in the message? She's a very patriotic woman. This was, this was obvious. I think that she was honored. I think that she was frightened. And I think that she was worried because if she knew that there was a conspiracy against General Washington, that might have sent her mind ahead to go, if, if Washington is removed from his post as commander in chief and they put a general in there that the troops don't like, will the troops mutiny? If the troops mutiny and the British hear about it, will they attack Valley Forge wherever, while everything's disorganized and vulnerable? I mean, it could spell disaster. It could have changed the whole outcome of the war. The Conway Cabal is, is well known, I think, to, to those of us who study history and the like. But was it a real threat to Washington? I believe it was. Now, historians Mark Edward Lender and Thomas Fleming would agree that it was a threat. And, and the reason they say it was a threat is because Washington's inner circle believed it was a threat. And they didn't think that everyone who was in Washington's inner circle would be just paranoid. Um, apparently, a lot of letters were going back and forth between the Continental Congress and Washington's allies there to Valley Forge, talking about the treachery of the people that were on the board of war and also some of the members of Congress that might have differing opinions from Washington, because even though we think that everyone was united in the cause, there was a lot of discord in the Continental Congress. There was a lot of discord in the army. And it was you know, kind of like it is now. Nobody could really agree on anything. Well, Congress has been known to interfere in, in many different ways. I'm not at all surprised about the, the cabal that was aligning itself against Washington. Talk a little bit about the role of of real American women during the revolution. Were, were, is Anna typical? Well, I think Anna was atypical in that she actually left her home to participate in some way. Women mostly at this time participated on the home front. Um, the embargo against imported British goods caused them to have to get their spinning wheels out of um, mothballs and, and get things rolling and weave cloth and help on the home front to provide supplies keep the businesses running, keep the farms running, raise the children, and sometimes even to come to the defense of their towns. So we, we've heard of women like Sybil Luddington who rode to warn people of the British coming like Paul Revere. We've heard of Betsy Ross, we've heard of Molly Pitcher, but there were probably thousands of women who stepped up and took part, but we just don't hear of those stories. And so Anna is an example of one of the unsung regular women in America who was a patriot and who took a stand for independence and liberty. Well, in, in my, my novel about Morgan and the Rifleman, going all the way to Quebec 
at the direction of Congress, by the way. It was their idea, not necessarily Washington. They wanted him to go on the offensive. And among them, the 100 riflemen that walked all the way from Virginia to Cambridge, Massachusetts, and then sailed up the coast to Maine and then walked that terrible hike into Canada, there were three American women. And what, yes. happened, what happened to them is not pleasant. One of them was actually killed in action. Yes, I read about that. And, you know, suffering under the same conditions as the men, the same privations, without comfort, living in tents or whatever huts, whatever accommodations were available, it certainly wasn't an easy life. And those women chose to go along with their husbands or to go along and be a camp follower and to provide support to the troops. You know, I, I've, I've, I've become a fan of yours. So I, I know that in your other books, your kind of common theme that runs through all of them is the pursuit of individual liberty. What, what made yes. you choose that theme? Well, we rarely fight for fewer freedoms. And you rarely read a book about somebody who's fighting to have their freedoms taken away. But it's my own personal belief. And it was a way to share what I believe in um, a fiction setting and also in a nonfiction setting, because some of my characters simply want to settle the American frontier and start a business and have that business thrive. Um, in my set of novels that is set in the future for young adults, um, it's to avoid being taken in by a totalitarian government and made to do things that they don't want to do. Uh, you know, typical dystopia, because the biggest, baddest bad guy is usually the government that extends its reach too far and infringes upon the rights of the people. Tracy, thank you very much for joining us today and providing facts in a fictional form for our fellow Americans to use during these challenging times. Tell our viewers how to get a copy of this great read. Well, thank you. Um, you can get the book on Amazon.com. It's also available in the online stores, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, and from Unison Books. And um, if you want more information about my research, it's available on my website, which is tracylawsonbooks.com. Tracy, you're great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Friends, if this broadcast has been informative, helpful, or encouraging, take time now to subscribe or comment and let me know your thoughts. By doing so, you too may become part of this historical record of how America persevered and once again prospered. Until next time, remember, Semper Fidelis is more than a slogan for U.S. Marines. Always faithful is a way of life.